Okay, welcome everybody. Thanks for joining us. Uh, today we're going to provide you with a baseline model for how to implement envelopes on Databricks. Um, we think this is a very useful model. Before you go running into deploying it to production, we really recommend that you test it with uh, the various stakeholders at your organization first. So joining me on stage uh, is Joseph Bradley and Niall Turbitt. I'll let them introduce themselves. Uh, sure. So, hi, um, Joseph Bradley. I'm a uh, product specialist on the same team as Rafi. Uh, basically, we're kind of liaisons between product and the field for machine learning. Um, I've been at Databricks for a while, was originally in ML engineering, uh, working a lot in open source Apache Spark, and more recently have been out in the field. Hey, everyone. My name is Niall Turbot. I'm a lead data scientist on the professional services team at Databricks. Um, so with that, um, I spend a lot of time with our customers designing, building, deploying production ML solutions. Uh, so given the variety of our customers, I've had the opportunity of working across a, a wide range of, of different use cases from e-commerce to financial services use cases through to applying ML in energy and industrial applications. Um, before my time at Databricks, uh, I spend time in data science and ML engineering roles uh, in companies um, in retail and the startup space. Ravi. And I'm also a product specialist here at Databricks. I focus on data science and machine learning as well as uh, developer experience. Um, I've had a lot of fun in the past couple of years helping customers scale their R workloads with Spark. And prior to Databricks, I was a data analyst and then I was trading commodities. Okay, so today, our talk is divided into two parts. The first part is gonna be very conceptual, sort of the underpinnings of what is MLOps, why you should care about it, um, who are the people involved and what is the overall process, and then we'll also provide some general principles that are applicable regardless of what your tech stack is. Then we'll go through and we'll disambiguate what uh, dev staging and prod means when you talk about MLOps. Then I'm gonna hand it over to Joseph, who's gonna go through a pretty detailed reference architecture for how you would implement this on Databricks. That's part one, and then in part two, we're actually gonna go through a demo real, real deep and uh, bring to life everything that we talked about in part one, the reference architecture and all the concepts. Okay, so to get started, let's begin with defining what uh, MLOps actually is. Okay, so MLOps is a set of processes and automation to, manage, to jointly manage code, data, and models for the sake of improving the performance, stability, and long-term efficiency of machine learning systems. Put simply, it's uh, DevOps plus data ops plus model ops. And in other words, the goal of MLOps is really to make your ML systems successful, ensure that they're successful and stable for a long time. So, Obviously everyone is here because they're interested in the topic, but I think it's good to take a little step back and really define like why we should care about this, why this is really important. It comes down to a couple different reasons. The first is, is that MLOps will help you reduce risk in your ML system. And there's really two kinds of risk. There's technical risk, and you could think of this as risk that's basically intrinsic to the system itself. So is your model performing poorly? How do you know? How are you gonna update it? Is your infrastructure fragile or flaky? How are you gonna repair it? Those are technical risks for your uh, project. The second kind of risk is actually risk with other systems, external systems. So is your ML system in compliance with corporate requirements or other um, regulatory requirements? So MLOps can help you there as well. The other big benefit is that we'll, uh, MLOps will improve the efficiency of your team in launching and releasing models. So and it does this through automation. For example, we can automatically test error, we can automatically test code and catch any errors before they reach production. And we can also avoid slow manual processes involved in the handoffs between different uh, people as they work in, uh, in, the, in the overall ML practice. So let's talk a little bit more about the people that are involved and the overall process with MLOps. So everything starts with business stakeholder. There's going to be some question, some business question, some business initiative that is going to catalyze all the other data practitioners going and, and uh, springing into action and doing their work. 
And this person is going to be responsible for the value of the ML solution at the end of the day. Then when it comes to the practitioners, you have data engineers. They build data pipelines. Data scientists consume those pipelines, and they work closely with the business stakeholder to understand what the business problem is, translate it into code, train and tune models. Those models are then handed off to ML engineers who are responsible for deploying it to production and managing it over time. And then sort of surrounding all of this is a role that we, we increasingly see is the idea of a data governance officer. And this is the one who's responsible for the activity of all these other personas and making sure that they're in compliance with um, data governance and, and uh, other regulatory concerns. So if we take these and we kind of overlay these different personas across the process of developing and deploying a model, this is sort of a rough idea of what this looks like. Now, in reality, it's way fuzzier than this. Lots of people do different tasks. They wear many hats, things like that. But this is, I think, a good rough approximation of these different tasks and, and the, uh, the ownership that people have across them. So um, hopefully at this point, it's become a little bit clear that MLOps is actually pretty hard because you need to think about data management, you need to think about model management, code management, and then you have all these different people that have different roles that need to be able to collaborate across this process in order to make it successful. So it's very, very hard to do this. How are we going to unify this? How are we going to simplify um, this complex process and kind of like bring everybody together under one roof? So about a year ago, we started talking about this idea of a data-centric ML platform. And the benefit of a data-centric ML platform is that it would help in unifying those uh, different personas and the necessary processes and disciplines involved in MLOps. So no surprise here, we're gonna bring everybody under the uh, roof of the Databricks Lake House. And for data ops, the foundation on Databricks is obviously Delta Lake. Delta Lake will help you manage all of the data associated with your ML system, whether that's your features, your predictions, your monitoring data, your logs, all of that can be managed at scale with Delta Lake. For model ops, we have MLflow to help us manage the um, model lifecycle, all the way from experimentation through to deployment and managing multiple versions of models that are running in production. And then for DevOps, we integrate really closely with the most popular Git providers and the CI CD systems that they offer as well. So all of this together comes to simplify the way that these personas that we talked about before can work together and make your applications successful. Okay, so before we go on, I wanna take a moment to talk about uh, four general principles that are applicable uh, regardless of what technology you use. You can help, these can help you implement MLOps in your organization. So the first one is gonna be always keep your business goals in mind. And by that we mean before you uh, consider taking on any technical work to implement MLOps, you should ask yourself, what is the business impact of this? Is this going to make the data team more productive? Is this going to enable new use cases? Is this going to reduce risk? If the answer to those is yes, then go ahead and do that work. But if not, then maybe you shouldn't invest in that um, technology. The second point is take a data-centric approach to machine learning. And by this, we mean that uh, ML pipelines are data pipelines. And they, are, they need to be as robust as any other data engineering process. Data quality is also uh, absolutely critical in machine learning pipelines. So you should take a systematic approach to how you monitor and ensure data quality in those um, systems. Another point here is that you wanna make sure that you avoid choosing tools that make it hard to join your ML data with the rest of your data. So if, if you have uh, predictions and monitoring metrics and things like that that live in another tool, another system, and you have to join it with additional data that you have in, an, in another tool, that's gonna make your life hard. So Again, choosing a data-centric ML platform is going to simplify that for you. Okay, third principle is you should implement ML ops in a modular fashion. Now this means um, both in terms of bringing software engineering best practices to your code, so implementing your code in a modular way that lends itself to unit testing and reusability by other teams, but also um, just at the process level, like getting together and defining, like these are the steps of our process as an organization, the people that are involved, and really having everyone understand what that is. Everyone be on the same page. Okay, last one, 
the process that you define should guide how you choose to automate things. Um, it's very tempting to automate things just for the sake of automation, but in particular um, with machine learning, I think it's important that we automate the steps of our process as needed. Um, so there may be times where you want to include a human in the loop, and so you should avoid automation. There may be times where uh, you want to facilitate a more rapid handoff between one persona and another, and that's a good place to introduce some automation. Okay, so now we covered what MLOps is, why you should care about it, and some of the fundamental ideas there. Let's talk about the meaning of dev staging and prod in the context of MLOps. And then we'll also talk about two different uh, model deployment patterns. So in your ML workflows, there's these three different assets. There's the code, the data, and the models. And all of, for each of these, they need to be developed, they need to be tested, and they also need to be deployed to uh, production. Okay, but those each need to be, um, for each one of those stages, they need to be uh, operated in a distinct execution environment. So really what you have is, you have three different environments that you need to set up in order to facilitate um, the development of these different assets. So you need a dev environment, a staging environment, and a production environment. Now, um, you know, different organizations, they may have only a dev environment and a production environment. Some may have more than three. That's totally fine. The idea is the same, that you have a development, a testing, and a production uh, setup. Okay, so I think the best way to understand these terms as they relate to code, data, models, and execution environment is in terms of the, the level of trust that you have for each asset, as well as how open they are in terms of the access. So if, you, if you're in your dev environment and you find an asset there, chances are you don't really know how good quality it is, but it's easy to find. Uh, if you go to the production environment, that's gonna be a much more, um, the assets that you find there, they're going to be of higher quality, you know they've been tested, and those are the ones that are actually powering your business. So because those are the ones that are actually powering, down your, powering your business, you want to make sure that those are also locked down. You want to have really strong isolation between these different environments. So that's the other way that you can kind of understand these uh, different terms here, right? So level of trust and openness of access. Okay, now how do you achieve that kind of isolation on Databricks? There's a few different ways that you can do that. Um, starting from the left, you could have in um, the public cloud provider of your choice, you could have multiple cloud accounts, and then in each cloud account, you can have a Databricks workspace. So at the cloud account level, they're completely separated from each other. The second option is um, you can have multiple Databricks workspaces, and this is really isolated at the network level. So single cloud account, multiple Databricks workspaces. And then the third option is, within a single Databricks workspace, you can have um, the access controls that are native to Databricks separate your code, data, and models from uh, dev staging and prod. We generally recommend the middle approach to have separate Databricks workspaces, but depending upon the resources that you have in your organization, you could go with either of the other ones and still be successful. So one of the things I wanna call out here, if you look at the, the one on the right, you might be tempted to think that there's like a one-to-one -one correspondence between data, models, and code across dev, staging, and prod. Uh, and that's not exactly correct, and I'd like to explain why. So there's this interesting fact that um, model and code life cycles, they actually operate uh, asynchronously from each other. So to help understand this, let's take two examples. So let's imagine we have a fraud detection model that we train weekly on the latest data. And we've already deployed our code to production. It's already set up on a schedule to train this model every single week. So our code is not really going to change very much, but the model every week is gonna go through a new process of being generated, then tested, and then if it's better than the one that's currently in production, that will be deployed into production. So the model lifecycle is actually happening faster than the code, the, the code lifecycle. On the other extreme, you can have a uh, computer vision model or a large language model that is very expensive to train, takes a very long time, and you're really only gonna do that once in a while. But you may update the code that you're using to write the predictions to a different database or how you monitor the uh, metrics and things like that. So this is a case where your, your model life cycle is actually slower than your code life cycle. So 
as a result of this phenomenon, it's, um, it's important to have a service that will actually allow you to manage your models independently of your code. And that's exactly what MLflow is for. That's what MLflow does. OK, so let's summarize all this. So we have these four different kinds of assets. They're, whether you call it dev staging or prod kind of depends upon which one it is. And how you isolate them also kind of depends upon what it is. So if you're talking about execution environments, whether if it's a dev environment, it's because that's where, that, the, that's where development is taking place. If it's a production environment, it's because that's where production systems have been wired up to. And typically, you'll separate this at the cloud provider level or using Databricks workspace uh, access controls. Um, for models, that's going to really be dependent upon which uh, lifecycle phase the model is in. Is it a dev model? Has it been tested? It's in staging? Or is it deployed to production? MLflow has access controls for this, and you, or you could lock this down at the uh, cloud storage level uh, using the permissions that are native to that. Data actually does kind of have a one-to-one -one correspondence with the execution environment. So if you've produced data sets in the dev environment, then they're probably going to be dev data and so on. Code, uh, typically going to be labeled according to the software development lifecycle. So you'll have dev branches, you'll have a main branch, and then you'll have releases and so on. And you'd lock this down using Git. OK, so now that we have an understanding of the semantics and this fact that models and code operate asynchronously, um, there's two different ways that you can actually deploy models into production. So the first is, when we call this deploy models, you really kind of focus on the uh, model artifact that gets generated by your tra training code. So in the dev environment, you will train your model. It's going to output this artifact. And then you'll move that to your staging environment, test it, and then move it to your production environment assuming it passes your tests. The other approach is actually you, you think about more the process that builds the model artifact, and that's the, uh, that's the unit that you take and then move from environment to environment. So here you take your training code, and you deploy it to the staging environment, and then you deploy it to the um, production environment. So obviously, one big practical difference here is that you're going to be training the model uh, three times in the deploy code. So in this talk, we're going to focus on the deploy, uh, deploy code uh, pattern. The reference architecture is very much built entirely around this, and the demo is as well. OK, so let's take a little closer look at this process. So in the dev environment, what are you going to be doing? You are going to develop your training code there. You'll develop all the ancillary code. And by ancillary code, we mean your feature engineering, your inference code, your monitoring code, anything else that has to do to support the the model, right? Um, assuming you like what you've developed, then you'll promote that to the staging environment. What happens in the staging environment is going to be testing of the model on a subset of data, basically a form of integration testing. And then you'll also test your ancillary code with unit and integration tests. And assuming that everything works out, you'll promote that to the production environment. OK, and then in the production environment, you'll train the model again on the entire data set on the production data that you have. And then you'll test the model against the current one that you have if, it's, if you have an existing version. Finally, you'll deploy the model. And then you will deploy any other ancillary code this way, too. So it's kind of like bringing the software engineering practice of you know, dev staging and prod and testing everything and deploying all your code. Same, same idea. We're just applying it to machine learning. OK, so what are the benefits of this approach? Right? Why would we choose this one over the deploy models one? So in terms of automation, um, this actually makes it easier to support automated retraining. Because in the production environment, it's a very locked down environment. It's very hard for anybody to go in there and tamper with the training code. So you know that if you kick off a new training job, that it's going to be very reliable in terms of its uh, outcome. In terms of data access, this is actually a little bit simpler. Because you don't need to provide production data access to these other environments necessarily if you don't want to. You can simply provide it in the production environment, and that's where you do your final analysis of whether you deploy this new model or not. Similarly, for reproducibility, the production environment is, there's going to be fewer people maintaining that. And that, and that engineering team is going to be able to better control the environment that models are trained in. So this helps, again, prevent issues with human error and tampering and things like that. Um, because this is following a deploy code pattern in, in traditional software engineering practices, 
it actually will allow you to accelerate and launch many more models with a smaller team than if you had to do a more manual process and in managing individual artifacts separately from code. Now, two potential uh, downsides that people might call out is that you know, for data scientists that may not be as familiar with these practices, they might have to learn how to write code that they can hand off in this way. And the end team might have to set up the infrastructure to do CI CD testing and things like that. Now, some people might look at that and they would say that's a good thing, um, but it depends upon your perspective. Okay, so with all that being said, that's the intro. Those are all the sort of fundamental concepts. And I'm gonna ask Joseph to come up and he's gonna go through a reference architecture for how you would, um, what this all would look like on Databricks. Cool, thanks Rafi. So what Rafi was doing was laying down the fundamentals. And this next section basically wanted to talk through um, a full holistic architecture and then deep dive into the dev staging and prod parts of that architecture, um, getting a bit more detailed. Um, and then of course at the end, we'll go through an actual demo to get make this really concrete. I do wanna emphasize that just like Databricks is multi-cloud or fairly cloud agnostic, this, this reference architecture is cloud agnostic. So it is a reference architecture where you would adapt it to fit with your systems, whatever it, you know, existing or to be built out systems there are. This is a high level architecture and I know it's a bit of an eye chart, but I'll, that's okay. You don't need to read every box because we'll talk about a lot of them in the zoomed in versions. I do wanna point out at the very top, there's a gray box for source control. And as Rafi was saying with this deploy code architecture, source control is our primary mode of getting ML pipelines from development to production. You can see we have a dev branch, a merge request going to a staging branch, which by the way, we're calling main because we often see the main branch used as the de facto staging branch, but you, know, you can swap out the labels if you have other Git practices. And then once you cut a release branch, that release branch corresponds to you know, that production version of that code. At the bottom is the Lakehouse Foundation. And this is drawn as well a pool or lake of data where there are data tables, feature tables, metrics tables, and these are all just tables in the Lakehouse. This is important of course because it gives that flexibility which is needed to connect that data to Databricks or to your own other tooling, other cloud services. And it also lets you apply access controls to define uh, much more flex flexibly what corresponds to dev data, staging data, and production data. Now within each of these boxes from development in gray or blue on the left, staging in red in the middle and production in green on the right, you can see there are pipelines being developed on the left hand side like model training, feature table refresh, et cetera. And you can also see those deployed in production on the right. These are hidden in the staging environment in the zoomed out view, but we'll see them when we zoom in again. The important thing being that you're developing the same modular ML pipelines in dev, and then staging mimics those modular pipelines running in production, and then you actually run them for real in production. Similarly, the model registry is highlighted in production because it plays like an especially important role there. But realistically, that same service would be available in staging and development, and we'll see that in the zoomed in version. All right, so I want to take a moment to zoom in to the dev environment. Here you see source control on the right, and I'm gonna kind of walk through the workflow that a data scientist might go through. This might be a new project, it might be an existing one, but at any rate, you would check out a dev branch to make modifications. You can see an example structure, you know, .py files for your different ML pipelines. Um, and that would be checked out and iterated on in the dev environment. You can see it pulling from Lakehouse data on the bottom where in this zoomed in version, we do highlight that, you know, a data scientist might have read access to production data if it's a, you know, if, if governance requirements prevent that, you know, this, certain, this prod data box certainly could be a mirror of the prod data or an obfuscated version, synthetic data, whatever is required. But it is also important to have a dev data space or wh what I like to think of as a scratch space where if I'm developing, say, a feature table refresh pipeline, you know, in 04, 
I'm able to test running that pipeline, write to dev feature tables, make sure that works with the model training pipeline I'm working all in the dev environment so that I do have write access in dev. Note that we do separate out exploratory data analysis on the left here from the structured ML pipelines, EDA with notebooks, visualizations, iteration, and so forth being really important for, well, exploration, but maybe not necessarily becoming part of the structured code which gets deployed. The final thing I'll point out about model training is that as you iterate, fitting one model, then doing tuning, fitting other models with tweaked code, this needs to log what it's doing. And in Databricks, this would be logging automatically to an MLflow tracking server. You know, the code version, input data, uh, input parameters, et cetera, which go in, metrics and models which come out. This, of course, is useful in iterative development, both for like going back and saying, what did I do yesterday? Or maybe I fit 1,000 models in tuning. How do I programmatically read all, that, all those metrics in and figure out which model really is best? But also it puts in place that tracking, which will become important when this model training pipeline gets to production. You'll want that same tracking to uh, track, you know, for the sake of reproducibility and governance, exactly how those prod models are created. So once that's done and the data scientist is happy with this, they'll commit the code back to source control. That brings us to the staging environment where once there, that code is checked into the dev branch in source control, one can make a merge or pull request to the staging branch. That's going to come down here, kick off CI tests. Those usually start with unit tests, which are of course lightweight, fail fast tests, which don't really touch data or services. It's then recommended to run integration tests. And it's here you see that those same ML pipelines, which were available in production, can be run in a mirrored version in the staging environment. They can touch actual data. Here we see it working with staging data. And they can also read from and write to services like the MLflow tracking server for model training and the model registry for managing a model as it goes through deployment and inference. Once these tests pass, of course, the code would be able to be merged into the staging branch. After potentially multiple pull or merge requests, they'd be ready to cut a release, and uh, that would be done by the ML engineer. That finally brings us to the production environment where, quote, cutting a release. In cutting a release, the ML engineer redeploys one or more of these ML pipelines to production. So we're showing some canonical pipelines in these boxes in production. The actual boxes here, of course, could vary based on your application's needs, for example, Here's a single, single feature table refresh pipeline, uh, reading in raw data, spitting out new feature values in the feature tables. You might have multiple of these pipelines, um, or maybe none if it's handled by a separate team. All of these pipelines, for example, feature table refresh, could be manually triggered, scheduled, um, or uh, triggered by automation. For feature table refresh, for example, it would often be uh, depend really on you know, how frequently you get new data from your business systems. Um, as feature tables get updated, of course, model training pipelines are able to pull from them. The model training pipeline here lists training and tuning. And one thing I do want to point out is that at a lot of our customers, it becomes important to think about for that application how much tuning should be go into automated training pipelines in production. Um, it's common to, for a data scientist to want to try a bunch of model types, a bunch of hyperparameters, but maybe limit that set of choices in automation and production, both for the sake of limiting expense if you're fitting on huge data sets and also for the sake of limiting variability of that system. Once a model is fit, it gets logged to the model registry in stage none, or dev stage model. That's then picked up by the CD process, a continuous deployment process. And the point of that is to take that model from dev to staging to production. And here, keep in mind, this is what Rafi is referencing about models and code going at a different speed, where you know, initially, we updated each of these pipelines as we deployed that code to production. 
but the model registry service remained constant. Same model was in production. Now we're going to run the model training and deployment pipeline. The code is staying static. The model is being updated. And so this loose connection allows these to move at different rates. In general, with continuous deployment, initial move from dev to staging includes compliance checks, smaller tests, and so forth. The move from staging to production is more a champion challenger situation where you want to make sure that you know, on data where you have actual labels, that model is doing better than the current production model before it replaces it. But if so, then the CD pipeline would replace it. That model can then be picked up by downstream systems. Online serving could load that model, you know, send out its responses and log requests and predictions. Similarly, for inference, doing batch or streaming inference, pick up the model, publish new predictions. We're showing both of these pipelines here. In reality, you know, for your given application, depending on latency requirements and throughput requirements, you would probably just pick one of these. Importantly, these requests and predictions for any serving or inference pipeline should get logged back to the lakehouse as tables. That makes it really simple for them to be picked up by monitoring, which again, publishes metrics back as lakehouse tables. Having these in the lakehouse makes it really simple for those to be picked up by various systems, you know, dashboards for monitoring, alerts for notifications, and also maybe read-only access in the dev environment so that the data scientist can explore issues in production. All right, so that kind of wraps it up with the reference architecture. Um, and now I think we'd like to get a lot more concrete by uh, turning it back over to Niall to talk through the demo. Thanks, Joseph. Perfect. So Joseph has just walked us through a really nice set of diagrams illustrating that end-to-end -end workflow, but hopefully you're now sat there thinking, great, but how do we practically implement that? So what we're going to focus on in this second part of the talk is, firstly, how do we think about doing that end-to-end -end in a practical manner and setting up that MLOps workflow? So we'll first address a fictional use case that we want to solve. So I, as a data scientist, am working with Joseph, an ML engineer, on our fictional uh, data team. And we've been approached by uh, our business, a, a business unit within our company to solve a given issue, and we'll, we'll unpack that. We'll also deconstruct our solution um, through a couple of different lenses. So the first being the actual pipelines that we're looking to deploy. And this will really link it back to those diagrams that Joseph just walked us through. We'll also unpack the tooling that we'll use. So what are the technologies that we're going to use to manage our code, our data, and our model artifacts? Then before we actually get into the demo itself, we'll also have a look at the project stu structure. So this is primarily just the primary with the kind of core components of the, the actual solution that we'll be walking through. And then we'll get into the demo where, as I mentioned, myself and Joseph will put on our data scientists, our ML engineering hats, and we'll see kind of where the handoffs happen in that end-to-end -end workflow. Lastly, Rafi's gonna finish up with where you can find all the resources, so such as the repo that we're gonna go through right now, as well as all the kind of uh, diagrams, an actual ebook that kind of really encapsulates all this together. So, myself and Joseph, as I mentioned, we're working for a fictional telco company. And we have been approached by the marketing department within our company to ask us, is there any way that we can predict customer churn? For this, we're going to use a customer churn data set which is an openly available data set from IBM. And with that, what we have are customer records for just over 7,000 customers. And with that, we have customer IDs, along with nearly 20 uh, attributes that indicate kind of demographic information and contract-based information, along with an actual label column that indicates whether a customer has churned from either one of our phone or internet services within the last month. So we have worked with the business unit to really define what is it that we're trying to solve. So what is the actual business value that we're seeking to address here? And really 
crystallizing what is the business metric that we're seeking to optimize. So we've worked with the business team to define that metric. We want to minimize the monthly revenue that is lost to customers who are churned. And we go through a whole POC process. So we're building out a proof of concept. We find that against some baseline, we have a classifier model, which is performing significantly better than just a heuristics based system. And what we want to do is build out an end-to-end -end MLOps workflow that allows us to deploy and continuously update our model in production. Before we come to the actual repository and the actual solution itself, like I said, we want to deconstruct things through a couple of different lenses. So firstly, how are we going to look about managing that code, data, and models in that one centralized um, platform? And again, as, as Rafi had mentioned, we're doing so under the banner of our Databricks Lakehouse platform. So just to make this a little bit more concrete, I'm going to overlay those three pillars of DevOps, uh, DitOps, and ModelOps on top of that multi-workspace or multi-environment view that, that Joseph just walked through. So on the, the DevOps pillar, we're going to be using Git to manage our code. So it's going to be our source control. And in particular, for this example, we'll be using GitHub, um, which will manage our actual repository itself. And with that, if we do want to incorporate any notebooks into that repository, we can also use Databricks repos to basically sync with that GitHub repository and push any notebooks to it. We'll also be using GitHub Actions, and this is going to manage our whole CI CD workflow. So it's really going to help us automate the building of our package itself, the deployment, and the testing that Joseph also spoke about. Lastly, under that DevOps banner, we're also going to be using an open source um, tool by Databricks Labs called DBX. And really what DBX is, is a lightweight wrapper over the top of um, Databricks uh, command line interface. And it provides us a few different benefits. So the first being that it allows us to easily define um, Databricks jobs that we can then subsequently deploy. And with that, it offers us a really nice way of working from an IDE. So everything that we'll be showing you here is, is IDE-based development. So we're kind of assuming that we've gone through a phase of iterating in a notebook, but we really want to package this up as a more robust production-ready system. And DBX allows us to easily develop within an IDE, create the definition of a pipeline or a job, I should say, or wrapping one of our pipelines as a job, and running that interactively against a interactive cluster if need be, and then further also allowing us to do so in an automated way. Another last component of DBX, which is some nice functionality in which we use, is that it gives us a basic Python template, and this is effectively what our solution is built on top of. It provides a skeleton structure on top of which we can then stitch in um, the kind of logic for our jobs. It should be noticed, noted that everything here we are using is kind of what is openly available and, and generally available at the minute, but kind of pending the announcements that were made earlier, a lot of what we have done here with regards to the pipelines could ultimately be subsequently um, used with MLflow pipelines at a later stage. On the data ops front, so we will be using Delta um, for our kind of raw ingest data format, and that's really the, the foundation of our, our lake house and our, our fundamental layer that we'll be ingesting from. Further to this as well, we'll be using Databricks Feature Store. So during development um, and our POC phase, we discovered that a lot of these features that we were building out actually could be valuable to other business units. So how could we make those features widely available and accessible and very findable? So what we've done is use Databricks Feature Store, which provides that centralized repository to make those features findable and usable across different business units. And it also then provides us some really nice functionality around tracing lineage back from the actual model artifact that we're deploying right the way through to, well, what features were, were consumed, and I'll show you where, how you can kind of trace that lineage. It also allows us to, uh, to really ensure that our feature computation code is exactly the same as that feature computation code that happens at inference time. 
under that model ops pillar finally then, um, really splitting this acro across two different tracks. So what happens during model training where we are going to be tracking our, uh, model, our, our model parameters, our metrics, our actual model artifacts, and we'll be doing that uh, with uh, ML flow tracking. And then how do we manage the actual model life cycle once it is in, say, for example, the production environment and we want to transition it through those multiple stages. So just to deconstruct things down the actual pipelines that we want to deploy. And again, making this a little bit more tangible, relating it back to what we saw earlier. We're thinking about this through the lens of what are the ultimate pipelines that we're, de that we're deploying to the production environment. So firstly, what Joseph addressed was the feature table refresh component. For the purposes of our demo, what we'll have are a couple of initial pipelines. Ordinarily, you wouldn't have these in kind of a production um, solution, but we're doing this more so for the demo. So as the name suggests, we have a demo setup pipeline, which is going to really just ensure that we're starting from a blank slate. So it's going to remove any existing MLflow experiments, any existing MLflow models in the registry, and it's going to remove any feature store tables um, according to the config that we're specifying. We're also then going to have a feature table creation pipeline. And again, that's just setting us up to have a kind of static feature store table that we can consume and, and train a model pipeline on. So we're going to have a, uh, we're going to start from a clean slate in terms of creating a database, creating a table, uh, that, which we're going to use for our feature store. And it's also then going to create a, a labels table. Under the, again, just syncing this back, so where we had model training, we will have a model train pipeline and what that's going to do, again, this is a kind of fairly simple solution that we're looking at here, but we're going to create a simple um, sklearn pipeline. It's going to be a random forest classifier. And with that, what we're going to do is track everything out to MLflow. So we're going to define our pipeline via some config. We're going to train it. We're going to track everything out to MLflow tracking. And the outcome of that pipeline, so once that pipeline successfully finishes, we're going to register the model to the MLflow model registry. In the way of our continuous deployment, we're going to have this model deployment pipeline. And really what that's doing is it's going to compare two models against some provided reference data set. So this is a kind of snapshot that we need models to perform um, well against. So we have our current production model. We're going to assume that we have a kind of steady state, a model in production. And we have, as Joseph mentioned, this new challenger model that's come along. And we want to compare those two things. We're going to predict against that reference data set if that staging model is outperforming according to some specified criteria against that current production model. Then we're going to promote that staging model to production. Conversely, if our production model outperforms that of the staging model, then we will retain the current production model and archive that challenger staging model. In the way of inference then, for this demo, we're going to focus on a batch inference use case. So we'll have this model inference batch pipeline. What that's going to do is consume features from the feature store. It's going to load our model from the production stage in the model registry, perform batch inference, write out predictions to a delta table in our lake house. Um, and we'll actually be powering a, a dashboard in Databricks SQL on top of that. So it should be noted we're focusing on batch for this use case. Given the use case, we're predicting kind of customer churn on a weekly basis. Batch is the most cost effective way of doing this. But we will call out how this overall workflow is, is generally applicable for streaming use cases, for real-time deployment as well. Lastly as well, so we do have monitoring in the, that original architecture diagram. We don't have monitoring in the repository itself for the demo today. However, we will call out kind of how this is possible. Um, we will show a dashboard of what we've kind of mocked up, but everything is, that is contained within the repo today is kind of what is generally available. Um, but we will call out how uh, monitoring could be incorporated in there as well. Before the demo, lastly then, what does our project structure look like? And this is primarily just a primary, like I said, the, those core components of this. So we're using DBX to start up that basic template. And with this, we get a couple of different configuration directories. So this initial DBX project JSON, 
What that's allowing us to do is specify the different environments to which we want to deploy our pipelines. So we'll have, in our case, a dev a workspace, a staging workspace, a production or prod workspace, and also defining within that what are the um, locations within the Databricks file system that we want to upload our, pa our package to. So whenever we're building things, we're going to create a Python wheel file. Where are we deploying that to, or where are we uploading that to? In the way of managing CI/CD, we have a GitHub workflows directory. And for those of you that are familiar with setting up GitHub actions, you'll note that we will have two different um, definition files. So these are two YAML files, which define what happens whenever we create that pull request. So what happens whenever I make I, I as a data scientist and making some change to the code, I want to trigger a testing, trigger testing and staging, defining the exact steps that happens when that occurs. And then also we will ha we'll have a YAML file which defines what happens whenever we cut a new release. Also within our repository, we're going to have um, requirements. Requirements.txt is the dependencies that we, that we install on top of the Databricks runtime that we are running against. Unit requirements then, as the name suggests, are the requirements that we require for running unit tests either locally or on the GitHub Actions runner that we're running against. And setup.py just allows us to build that Python wheel file. Conf is essentially this catch-all configuration directory. And we'll see how we have a number of different envir environment uh, variable files. We'll see how we have this job configs uh, directory. And under that, we have our kind of pipeline um, configs. And for each of those different pipelines that we're, we'll, we're deploying, we essentially have a unique configuration file. So say, for example, our model train pipeline, we want to define, well, what are the exact hyperparameters that we want to use for that? What is the name of the MLflow run that we want to do for that? Also within that, we then have this deployment.yaml file. And that's used by DBX as this kind of core uh, source of truth as to what are the job configs to deploy whenever we are deploying those um, jobs to our workflows in our workspaces, and along with that, the, the cluster configurations that we might want to use. We'll also have telco churn. So in this example, telco churn is going to contain our Python source code. So this is really the kind of core logic that I, as a data scientist, am, am writing for those pipelines. We'll double click into that in one second as well. And then lastly, we have a test directory under which we have our unit tests, which as Joseph mentioned, are those faster running um, tests which test the smaller kind of core components of our um, core functionality of our, our, our package. And then integration tests, which are those longer running tests that, that run um, in a longer manner, but test more comprehensively the functionality of our package. So who owns what within this, within this project? As Rafi mentioned, oftentimes many people wear many hats, but we kind of broadly divide this project in terms of who owns what into ML engineer, data scientist, in the sense that the ML engineer really owns everything to do with the config, everything's to do with really automating the building deployment um, and, and testing of the package itself. The data scientist then, I get, you'll see some crossover here. But a data scientist really owns the actual kind of core Python source code, so the underlying logic for the different pipelines that are being deployed. But with that as well, data scientists will work hand in hand with that ML engineer to define well, what are the, the pipeline configurations that need to be used, what are the dependencies that need to be installed whenever running these pipelines. And, and also with regards to that CI CD process, well, what are the exact pipelines that need to be deployed? Um, and What's, what tests need to be triggered? Where do those tests need to be triggered? So just double clicking on this telco churn that we have in our example. So this is, again, this is our Python source code, which is going to encapsulate the, the underlying logic that we want to deploy in each of those pipelines. Coming back to those guiding principles of keeping everything as modularized as possible, you'll note that we, we're going to deconstruct things completely. So in the way of each of our different pipelines, 
under telco churn will have the likes of, for example, feature eyes, feature table creator. And this is really delineating the kind of logic that's used to perform data processing in this instance against and contrasting against feature table creator, which is essentially just takes a data frame and writes that out as a um, feature store table in Databricks. Likewise, we have this for all of the different pipelines. So model train pipeline and model train are two different modules. Model train pipeline will just create that base scikit-learn model, whereas model train will take some generic um, model definition and it will run end-to-end -end training and tracking against MLflow the, and track everything to the MLflow tracking server. And likewise, we have these various modules which align to those different pipelines that we're deploying. Lastly, we have this jobs package. And under that jobs package, we effectively have, for each of those different pipelines, take that pipeline core logic, wrap it as a Databricks job, unpack the config that we're using, and trigger it as a Databricks job. So coming to the actual workflow itself, what are the kind of high level, what is the high level workflow that we're gonna be looking at? We're gonna be starting in a steady state. So this is assuming that we've gone through the POC phase, we're happy with everything, we've deployed a model to production. That model in production is a, a model registered in the production stage in our production environment. We also have our feature store tables we have the existing pipelines that we need deployed to production. So this is going to be our uh, model train pipeline. It's going to be our model deployment pipeline, our model inference pipeline, our batch model inference pipeline. We're also going to have then a monitoring dashboard, which is monitoring the health of our, uh, of our model in production. I, as a data scientist, notice that the model is degrading in performance in some way. I might be prompted by a monitoring uh, dashboard, as we'll see. And what I want to do is update the model. So what I'm gonna do is, in my dev environment, I start to iterate, try new hyperparameter configurations. I find that if I change some hyperparameters that um, I actually improve model performance against a holdout set. And I want to update that training config so that our tr model train uh, pipeline, it takes this model train config, I want to update that. I'm going to, from my dev environment, update that config. I'm going to push that as a code change. Upon pushing that code change, I'm going to create a pull request in Git. And upon, upon doing so, we're going to automatically kick off our continuous integration pipeline. And that's going to, as Joseph talked through earlier, it's going to kick off our unit tests our integration tests, and if those things run successfully, then those changes that I've made to that config will be merged into the main branch, which is our, our staging branch in this case. At this point, this is where we come across to our ML engineer, Joseph, in this instance, who's then going to see that those tests have successfully passed. He's going to cut a new version, so a new release branch, and upon creating that new release, trigger the continuous deployment pipeline. So that, again, everything is being automated here. As soon as that new release is tagged, what we're gonna have is that continuous deployment pipeline kicked off, and that's going to deploy those three different pipelines as Databricks jobs to the production workspace. And again, it's gonna be our model train pipeline, deployment, and inference pipeline. Lastly, we'll also see how we can then either manually trigger those pipelines or we can also automate those workflows as well. So finally, let's get into the actual demo itself. Great, so I'm going to come to a couple of different dashboards for, first, and really this is actually starting at the end and, and working our way back. So our model is currently in production itself, and we have this churn dashboard, and really this is the, the thing that's being consumed by our business. And it's, it's identifying, well, who are the at-risk customers, in particular uh, customers that we can call out that are predicted to churn and some attributes about them. And actually drawing it back to our, our, our core business metric that we actually care about. So we see, well, what is the predicted churn, the monthly revenue risk? 
Also underlying this is a monitoring dashboard which uh, I, as a data scientist, Joseph as an ML engineer, are informed by. We'll see us as well once Joseph comes on how the, we can actually build this out towards the end. But just a high level view at this stage, we can see how I can monitor my, my input uh, features in terms of input statistics, and I can check out model quality through time as it's making um, those predictions. Just to see that model in its steady state in production, I'm gonna to come to our workspace. And, and just to, to kind of draw the thread back to what Rafi was talking about in the ways that we can effectively achieve dev staging prod with respect to Databricks, we're doing so in a single workspace for the purposes of this demo. Um, albeit we have divided what I have access to in the, in the, in the way of a data scientist to the, the dev aspect of this through uh, access controls. So for example, we have this project uh, we, within the workspace in which we have dev, prod, and staging folders. I said data scientist would only have access to dev. We'll see how prod then has the, the kind of production ML flow experiments within it. Before we do come back to that though, let's, let's check out that steady state. So I'm gonna to go to models, and I'm gonna search for my model in production. So if I navigate into this end-to-end -end MLOps telco churn prod, so this is our production model, and we see that under that, I have this version one, which, which Joseph has put into production quite recently. We have version one of this, so if I click into that, I see how we can start to track the lineage back to initially the, the source run, so I see this, this comes from this random forest baseline model, and we can see then the activities against this. So just navigating to the, the underlying source run, just to start to trace that lineage. We see under the, the tracking run, and again, this is all automatically tracked out within that pipeline once we execute it. We have our model parameters. So notably, we have this random forest classifier, max depth four, which we've supplied. And we've stripped out all of those various uh, hyperparameters that we've used within the pipeline itself. We also then have our metrics. So that's our test metrics, our training metrics, which have been recorded whenever that pipeline has run. Various tags, such as what was the data source that we used for that. And we'll also then note how we have this variety of, of different YAML files tracked out, again, during uh, model training. So that configuration file is the configuration file to execute the pipeline. So we'll note how we've provided these model parameters that have been unpacked during the run, the, the actual run name, various pipeline parameters. And then we have this FS model, and that's the, the actual model artifact that we have tracked using the Feature Store API. So this, this gives us a couple of different elements. So underlying it is the actual MLflow model itself, but we also then have our Feature Store metadata. And this is where we can start to trace the lineage back from the model in the registry, back to the model in the tracking server, back to then the actual feature tables that were used. And so we're unpacking this from a, a visual standpoint, but from a, an automation standpoint, at inference time, what that feature store API can then allow us to do is effectively pick up those features from the feature table, load those in automatically, load the actual model artifact itself and perform inference in a really, in essentially one line. So just to have a look at the actual features that were used for this model in particular. So we see that we have a number of different input columns. We have the contract co uh, feature, a dependence feature, device protection feature. In this case, we have taken these all from a single feature store table, this end-to-end -end MLOps prod churn features. And I can start to actually trace this back to the underlying features, feature store table. So just navigating to the feature store UI, I can search for that feature store table. And again, we're gonna have a lot of information here about who created the feature store table. 
permissions-wise, who would have uh, access to this feature store table. The producer, so what was the underlying job that produced this? And then the actual features within that feature table. Lastly, within this workspace then, so we're, think, we're approaching this from the perspective of what are the various pipelines that we have deployed. We're deploying these as workflows. And with regards to, again, tying this back to what are the pipelines that we're deploying, we have our model train pipeline, we have our model deployment pipeline, model batch inference pipeline, and these are all within the, the production environment, as it were. So what we want to do is update the underlying config for our model train pipeline. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to navigate to my IDE. I'm going to create a branch, a new dev branch against which I'm going to start to make some changes. So I have been in my dev workspace. I have started to iterate against um, the model itself. So just coming back to that, the, the model in the registry itself, what I did is in an offline setting, I noticed that model quality was drifting over time. So it was kind of bouncing around a little bit and deviating, deviating a little bit from what I'd previously noticed. So I'm going to go again into my model and just trace this back to the underlying run. And what I've noticed is max depth equals four seems a little bit low. I start to iterate on things and I, I actually find that if I change max depth equal to eight, in an offline setting, it's actually starting to prove things slightly better. So what I'm going to do is I want to make a code change. I want to run everything through testing, make sure that all tests pass, and at which stage I will be handing things over to Joseph, who will then deploy that updated pipeline. So let's first create a new branch. I'm going to then navigate through uh, my repository in PyCharm here. So again, coming back to what we saw earlier, we have our DBX config, we have our GitHub workflows. Under conf then, we then have the configurations for the various pipelines. So this will look familiar actually to the, that config that was, that was logged at training time. So if I go to job configs, down to model train, I'll see that I can set my max depth equal to four here. So those are the, the hyperparameters that are really unpacked by the, the, the pipeline job once it's executed. So I'm going to update this to eight. I'm going to change as well this name. So max depth update. I'm going to push this change then. Maybe max depth update. Let's set that upstream. So at this point, what's happened is I've made that code change. I've pushed it to Git. And I'm now going to navigate, navigate to GitHub. By the way, all of this will be uh, available at the end in terms of, of getting to this repository. It's, it's a public repo now, um, but we'll provide that all at the end. So if I just refresh this, what I'll notice is that my new branch, I've pushed a change. I'm going to compare and create this pull request, my max uh, depth update, create this pull request. And at this stage, this is where our automation starts to happen. So this is where our continuous integration pipeline is first going to kick off. So we'll see this CI pipeline is, is starting to run. Going to click into details here. So what is, what is really happening here? I'm just going to draw this back again to our diagram. So what I've done is I've updated this model train pipeline. I've specifically updated the config for it. I've created a dev branch. I've committed that code. I've now created this pull request to merge into staging itself. 
This has kicked off, so that, that actual pull request has kicked off that continuous integration trigger. And now what's happening is initial unit tests are being kicked off on the GitHub workflow runner. I'm, once those tests pass successfully, I'm then going to deploy a continuous integration testing pipeline to our staging environment. And hopefully, once that passes, that will then be merged. Those changes will be merged back into the staging branch. So just to collapse this down, and I'll, I'll break this out a little bit more. So what's happening is dependencies are initially being installed. And then we're going to run our unit tests, run our in, deploy our integration test, and run that integration test. But how exactly is this happening? I'm not going to unpack exactly all of the details within this, but let's start kind of high level. As I mentioned earlier, the deployment.yaml config under this conf directory contains the definitions of our various job pipelines, of our various, um, uh, of our various jobs that we want to actually deploy, and also the cluster specifications that we want to use. I'm just going to take an example job here. So under staging, we see that we have this sample integration test. We have our staging cluster configuration that we're going to use. We have this Python file entry point that we're going to use. And then it's going to take environment configs and a config file as well. So this sample test, for the purposes of a demo, is really just a, a, a count that is being deployed as a job to the staging workspace. How this is done then is then going to be defined under our GitHub Actions workflow. So what I've just done is created a pull request. If I go to pull request on pull request.yaml, what this is describing is on pull request to the main branch, what are the steps that then need to happen? So the steps are going to be setting up that Python environment on the GitHub runner, installing those dependencies, running our unit tests using PyTest, and then deploying the integration test pipeline using DBX and running that integration test pipeline. So this job, telco churn sample integration test, links back to what is being deployed here. We're doing so to the staging environment and then launching that at the same time. So at this point, I'm going to pass over to Joseph, who will pick up where the data scientist leaves off. And his role then is the ML engineer to deploy, hopefully, once these tests pass, the successful pipelines to the production. Cool. Thanks, Niall. All right. So yeah, as Niall said, this is kind of that handoff point where I, as an ML engineer, you know, I, I may not know or care much about the details of the data science going on in these tests, but I do know that they need to pass. I need to provision infrastructure, make sure they pass before I merge the pull request. Uh, the final thing that I want to, like, I guess reemphasize about what Niall was showing about the different configs in the code, if we flip back to it, is essentially that by having configs broken out into different environments like he was showing, we're able to make sure that we can provision a varying set of uh, you know, cluster sizes or whatever are required for each environment. If he's working with a you know, many terabyte data set, he may not want to iterate on that in dev. I may not want him to for costs. Uh, so he might end up working you know, in that on a, uh, in dev on a smaller set, but in you know, much larger one in staging test and then larger in prod. So it looks like our pull request tests have passed. And so I'm just going to go into this and say, you know, good job. We're going to merge it. <laughs> and uh, now we have gotten that code into our main branch. Cool. So um, I think GitHub's taking a moment to refresh. But there you go. It's merged. It's in the main branch. And I'm ready to cut a release. So we're going to manage our releases just via tags. And so uh, first, I want to uh, check out the main branch. Um, 
and then I will pull those updates, which were just merged. And you know, we already have a v0.1 release, and if we go to our Git project, then we can see that over here. Uh, this is going to be a, let's call it v0.2, and I'll just, uh, you know, in practice you give it a more descriptive name, but uh, I'm gonna say great job, Niall, for the, for the tag on that release. And then I will uh, push that to the origin. And now what? I want this to automatically redeploy those ML pipelines in production. And that is in fact what's going on. Um, if we flip back to our actions, you can see that a GitHub action is doing that for us. Now had uh, previously referenced two GitHub workflows. This is that second one for on release, which is going to take these updated pieces of code and replace some of these pipelines which are running in production, uh, like the model training job, for example. So here we are, I've cut the release, redeploying the code, but the model registry is staying constant uh, and is still um, uh, keeping, that, that production model has stayed consistent as the pipelines themselves are being replaced with refreshed workflows. Uh, so I'm gonna flip back to, let's see, pardon the flipping around, uh, to workflows where I'll want to uh, find the ones corresponding, let's see, good, telco churn model. So these are going to be um, updated by uh, this uh, CI pipeline, which is still chugging along, but is essentially setting up dependencies, in particular DBX, to interact with Databricks. Uh, here that interaction is permitted because we have uh, set up our GitHub repo uh, with secrets which allow its automation to interact uh, with the Databricks CLI. And then it's going to redeploy several of these jobs. Once the, uh, these jobs have been redeployed, basically I'm going to show some things manually, but you know, in practice I think some of these might be scheduled, some might stay manual, uh, some might be triggered. The first is going to be model deployment, then training, and then inference, and that's going to kind of you know, eventually bring us full circle. So while this is running, I can just show quickly like you know, roughly what this is doing, where dbx deploy, um, is specifying that the deployment.yaml uh, deployment file it includes a lot of the information about how this telco churn model train job is defined, but it's tweaked by the environment uh, being set for production. And now that has been deployed, I'm just going to go ahead and kick off training. What this will do is uh, run for a bit to train a new model. Um, and then once that has been trained, I'm going to see that appear as a new model version in the model registry. Cool. I'm going to note, like, we do wanna make sure to have time for questions and we're running, like, pretty close to the end of our time slot. So uh, I will, um, like, make sure that we do allocate some time for questions, even if I need to truncate, like, the last tiny bit of the demo. Um, but, so this is our version of the model currently in production. This model training job um, is green here, so you can see it is running. If I click into it, like, what do I want out of this? I, as an ML engineer, want to be able to maybe schedule it weekly, because I know the business gives us new data about which customers actually churned or did not every week. Here, I'm just showing how to set it up on a schedule manually could certainly be part of that job configuration if we wanted to ensure it. So this is now scheduled, will run weekly. Here I have done uh, one manual trigger. As this runs, of course, I and or the data scientist would want visibility into what is running. Could certainly click into the Spark UI, into logs, metrics, et cetera. So I could, for example, like click into logs to see, you know, what is actually going on in this job as it runs. 
I am not going to delve through the logs here, but just wanted to point out that that kind of functionality needs to be available to maintain visibility into these production systems. In terms of what is running here, um, if I go to the telco churn area in this repository, you know, that, as Niall said, pipeline is defining the actual like SK Learn pipeline structure, model train is running it. I, as an ML engineer, may not know or care about those details. I would probably focus on building this connective tissue between the model in this model train job.py file, which is essentially wrapping what I may consider black box model training code as a workload which can run via DBX on Databricks as a job or Databricks workflow. Um, the other thing I'd point out is that, you know, we had talked about how model tuning may or may not happen in dev, may or may not happen in prod. In this case, you know, we're showing where model tuning is being done like iteratively, iteratively in development, but then we want to constrain that model's behavior significantly in production. And so really just using a fixed set of hyperparameters in this automated production training job. This also is a nice point to kind of point out the benefits of this deploy code paradigm. Since we are treating the training code as just another ML pipeline, like we are deploying it to production alongside you know, inference, alongside featurization, et cetera, as just jobs. And so it's easy, really easy, to set up that automated retraining schedule. So that job finished, and we now have a new version of the model in production. At this point, I want to do some compliance checks and then uh, kick off a continuous deployment job. I'm going to skip my pretend compliance checks and just say, they're good. I'm transitioning it to staging. And now what I want to do is kick off continuous deployment uh, to compare that challenger model with the current production or champion model and replace that if it, uh, the new one is better. That champion model um, you know, has been uh, scheduled to run in production with this inference batch job. Note that if this model deployment job is indeed successful, it's going to swap out, um, like if I run that inference job now, it would run against the current champion model. As soon as the continuous deployment job finishes, it will have swapped those out under the hood, assuming my new model's better, but it won't, affect that downstream inference job. Cool, so for the sake of time, I'm going to say that uh, this completes, and when it does complete, what we're going to see is basically logs showing that the champion model has area under the curve blank, the challenger has area under the curve blank, and comparing these two, we see that the new model is indeed better and we'll see these automatically switched where this new version will be put into production. I would then run the inference pipeline, which you know, isn't that interesting in and of itself, but is great because it kind of brings us full circle. It is going to update a table in the lake house, which will refresh our business face facing dashboard. And it will also allow us to you know, start thinking about, well, what comes next? Well, monitoring to make sure that we can continue uh, to um, watch and make sure to either improve this model or make sure it keeps behaving nicely. Niall did promise that I'd mention how this works under the hood, where it is using existing tools right now. Um, what is missing, or what is in early uh, stages is the ability to automatically set these tools up for you. And so to, just to give you a, a taste of like what these tools are, I'm going to switch over to Delta Live Tables and show you a Delta Live Tables pipeline, which is actually powering that monitoring dashboard. So Delta Live Tables is fully available. If you're not aware of what it is, I highly recommend you check it out because it's an excellent example of how many ML pipelines are just data pipelines. It is designed for general data pipelines and is essentially using Delta Lake under the hood, of course, but a bit more aware of the data processing which is going on, allowing it to 
have more efficient allocation of resources, have better sort of repair of halfway run and then failed pipelines and so forth. Definitely check it out, but I won't dive into it here. But essentially what this is doing is picking up the logged predictions and uh, queries and the true labels once we have them, computing aggregations, uh, computing some analysis metrics and computing some drift metrics, and then it powers that dashboard. Cool, so that pretty much brings us full circle in terms of this architecture. And just want to wrap it up quickly by handing it off to Rafi to uh, talk about like how you can actually take this code, try it yourself, and um, get started. Thank you, Joseph and Niall. So, Thanks everyone for joining us here today. All the content that we went over is available in these different spots. So everything that we talked about is written up in the big book of MLOps. You can download it for free. Just go to this URL. And the repository with the demo and instructions is available as well. As I'll mention, this is public. There were a few other talks earlier today that are really, really relevant to this subject. So there's one from this morning on the feature store and MLflow pipelines, which is a major release that is going to simplify what we went through today and make it even easier. And then uh, later today at 5.30, I'm gonna be talking about uh, the Databricks notebook with a product manager from Databricks. And uh, some of that will cover how to bring in software engineering best practices to the notebook. So thank you all so much for joining us. And I think we have a few minutes for some questions. Raise your hand for questions. I see you first. Um, hi. So I, I wanted to ask about the separation of workspaces and particularly with the model artifact itself. So I've got a similar setup, um, but to try to avoid the data scientists replicating and reproducing, having to retrain multiple times, uh, what we've done is sort of use one central repository for MLflow and then reference that from the other ones. Uh, what sort of pros, cons do you see for doing that versus doing multiple accounts, multiple workspaces, retraining? Yeah, uh, yeah, I, I can start off with this one. Um, really, the, the reason for that model registry in the production workspace was you get the lineage right the way through in that single workspace, so that lineage won't transfer across multiple workspaces, and having that within the production workspace means that that workspace has access, number one, to production data. We trace lineage back through that. There are some other caveats with regards to kind of like real-time serving. You need that model registry model to be in the same workspace as to where that's running as well. So there, those would be the kind of typical caveats that there are, is that lineage through everything, through the feature store, through the actual model registry, back to the MLflow tracking server, which you would lose if you're going kind of mul across multiple workspaces. Um, yeah, I don't know, anything else you would add? I, I guess I would add that, um, I mean, what you're describing sounds like what we call like the deploy models paradigm, where like they're developed in dev, and then those models created in dev are pr tested and maybe staging and then promoted to production. Like that, you know, as I, I think Rafi is talking about, that is a valid use case and like, you know, if that model needs to be iterated on on a huge data set in dev, like there may be no point in redoing that in production. That may be a valid use case. Um, we've found that like, you know, it's basically going back to the pros and cons which Rafi is talking about in deploy code versus deploy models, but we do see the whole range. And I think most of the architecture would not change um, except that model training would be treated separately. Anyone else? What is your recommendation of setting up uh, experiments in for production environment? Because you have to reference it as experiment ID when you run the jobs. Because if it's, let's say, in a user workspace and it has to be, uh, say, stay with all the uh, log data for a long time, where we should be setting this one up? Yeah, I can, I can take this one. Um, so, so with respect to the demo itself and what we've showed through that repository is that under that conf, 
directory. We have then environment files, so it defines as environment variables for the dev workspace, staging workspace, and production workspace. And within that, I mean, you could define a specific, where your, uh, your experiments are tracked within the dev workspace could, could be completely different in a different workspace, and that's defined under a production environment. And basically, whenever we kick off that job, is loading those different environment files and, and passing those into the job definition. So production could have a completely different and unique uh, uh, path compared to what, what dev would use, even if it is within one workspace. What, like where, what would be the optimal location in, uh, let's say, in production environment that it's isolated? Like where would, because it's a, it's a, like a journal text data with uh, everything, with uh, experiment runs. Yeah, I mean, it's not like there's one kind of, you should absolutely do it this way. I mean, really, it's, it's almost an organizational thing. It's kind of, within that production workspace, how do you organize different projects within that workspace? So you might have a specific project related to your business unit that only people from that business unit, in terms of like an ML engineer from that business unit, can access that. So really, even within the production workspace, you could use ACLs to, and permissions as to who can access different projects within that. And then within that project, it could be, if you, the ML engineer, have access to that, then you pass a path to the experiment with it under that folder itself. So that could be one way of doing it. But again, there's no kind of silver bullet here. And we're not going to say and you stand up here and say you should absolutely do it this way. It's, it's very variable. I have, I have one more thought on that. I, I think actually today there's uh, only trade-offs. You, know, you, you can either have the dev workspace be where you have all your tracking data, and then, uh, then it's all visible in the UI, and it's, it's, it is accessible to data scientists. Um, obviously, you'll be running your code again in the, in the production environment, so some information will be available there as well. But how are data scientists going to get access to that? That's a little bit of a challenge, right? Like, so there's a little bit of a trade-off there of, Either you can have API access to the production workspace for reading what's happened with MLflow, or you can have the UI in the uh, dev workspace, but you know, there's a little bit of trade-off there. So I'm speculating here when I say this, but uh, it, I, I think that there's something that Databricks can do with the uh, Unity catalog to allow, um, if MLflow experiments become more of a first-class citizen in Unity catalog, then perhaps down the road we can expose those mm -hmm. to uh, the, the data scientists from the production catalog, let's say. Uh, that is totally speculative, but I'm just acknowledging that it's a challenge. Yeah. Um, a we, are, we have multiple questions here, but we're out of time. Just, so yeah. You can grab us at the end. Yeah, we can meet out in the hall. Yeah, yeah. And don't forget to rate this session. Thank you so much for your time. Thanks, Thank everybody. You. Thank you.